that's dope. This podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens. Please stay tuned for more information on this amazing company later in the episode. Crypto has a major problem with UX and UI. What does that mean? It means it's really hard for grandma to use and it's daunting and most people just don't get it. Well, I just sat down with Kosla, who is the creator of my Ether wallet and was the first to create an Ethereum non-custodial wallet. Now, obviously, there are many of them, but they still continue to innovate. We talked about the vision of what these wallets would look like in five or 10 years when we finally reach mainstream adoption and scale to billions of people. You don't want to miss this conversation. I'm going to throw you the hardball question first. Oh boy, what's that? Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. I think that we have a major UX, UI problem. That's what my ETH wallet is for, to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah, so actually that's a good question. I mean, this is, first of all, like I have to go a couple of years, not a couple of years, like seven years back because it's been since 2015, August, that's when Ethereum first came out. And that's when kind of like the Mike Thorold story started, even though I was reading about Ethereum, Yellow Paper and Bitcoin before that. Uh, on Reddit, as soon as they like launched the mainnet on Reddit, I realized the fact that so many people were having issues just opening their wallet and sending a transaction because it was just command line. If you ask me, that's the worst user experience you can give to the Ethereum users, right? So that's when, since I knew how to like interact with it in command line, I was like trying to figure out, okay, the JavaScript libraries, which are necessary to create web pages, did not exist back then. So I kind of had to re- or like write all those JavaScript libraries and then put together a small website called myethwallet.com. And then that's how myethwallet started. It was only able to unlock your wallet and then send a transaction and check your balance back then. That's that's the only thing that you were able to do. And that's exactly what people wanted. I mean, if you think about it, back then ERC20s didn't exist, NFTs didn't exist. All you can do is basically like what Bitcoin can do, just send value from point A to point B. Uh, but it did also have the smart contract functionality, but none of the actual contracts were developed yet. So people were just trying to, you know, send funds, unlock their wallet and like send some ETH to their friends and then play around with it. That's all they wanted to do. And only w- way to do it was command line. And once my the wallet came out and it was also open source. So people who are actually capable of reading the code were able to go through the code and was like, okay, this is this looks like a legit site. I'm not trying to steal anyone's keys or anything. So um, it just grew with it. Maybe 50 people back then, 100 people started using it and then it became 1,000. Hundred thousand, and then now we here we are at like three million unique users each month. Three million unique yeah. users of my Ether wallet. Yeah. So yeah, that's the backstory to my Ether wallet. And you had a great question: UI UX sucks, and that's like our main goal to solve that problem. And then it's, it's an ongoing process, right? Like tomorrow, I won't be able. To, I can't come here and say, "Oh, UI UX, we're going to solve it tomorrow." That's not going to happen because we still want to keep the non-custodial aspect of the whole process because we never want to be a custodian. Username, if you if again, if you go to any dApp that say, oh, we solved like the onboarding process, you can log in with your username and password, I will guarantee you 100% that's not a non-custodial wallet. Someone else owns your wallet. Someone else has access to that wallet. That means if that person or it's that organization, if that company goes down, your funds goes down with it. And we don't want, like, we, we never wanted to be that person. And that's why we want to keep that non custodial aspect of like the whole process, which also brings in all these other, you know, user experience issues, such as, oh, you had to onboard them using a mnemonic. Someone has to write down like the 12 words. And yeah, it's going, to, it's, it's, it's a process that we keep improving. But hopefully, eventually, uh, maybe in like next three to five years, there will be some kind of device that uses your biometrics, maybe like eyes, fingerprints, something like that to unlock your wallet and then somehow attach that to an actual like private key behind the scene. Until we get to that point, I don't think there's like a quick and easy way to say, oh, we don't need mnemonics anymore. Right, I, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's just uh, we talk about mainstream adoption. 
And we all know that it always comes back to grandma, right? But we all yeah. know that grandma is not doing this. Unless you're in the Philippines and you're playing Axie Infinity, in which case <laughs> you figured it out because you could actually make money doing it. But uh -huh. I, I think in general, yeah. it's just not something that people are comfortable. No. It's very scary being your own bank. Right? It, it is. It is. I mean, it, it, it comes with its own risk, right? Like, like, we trust our banks because, I mean, banks came out to say, okay, the recent banks exist. It's like, oh, we'll keep your funds safe. Like, it's a good place to keep your funds and I mean it might work for like if you have okay maybe five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars or even up to like ninety nine thousand dollars you like I would say a bank is actually a good and safe place because you're insured up to that amount and that is applicable to ninety percent of the population even maybe more ninety five percent of the population um, but like if you have let's say a million dollars bank might not be the best place to have it but still like okay good place to have it but like, let's say if you have like $10 billion, right, in liquid cash, I'm only talking about like 0.001% of the population, but that person might have to make a fortress to guard that liquid cash. So like the security aspect is not, it's not, it's not the same for each and every individual. It changes with what you're trying to secure. Yeah, Jameson Lopp once told me when I was asking him, like, why would people need multi-sig? Yeah. Know, obviously with CASA. And he was like, well, I like to tell people to basically scale to 10x what they have. Uh -huh. If you have $100,000 right yeah. now, whatever security solution you come up with it at this moment, yeah. would be Able to what you'd be it. thinking if you had a million. Or if you have a million, what would you be thinking if it was 10 million? A million. Yeah, no, that's that's actually great. I mean, that's what uh, blockchain, I mean, that's what blockchain is trying to solve, right? Uh, because like blockchain already, like that's where your funds are. So that's where... It's already mathematically proven that it's your funds are actually secure. Okay, the other two security vulnerabilities that you might have to face is how do you access it? That's where like an uh, interface like mytowallet.com comes in. And the other one is actually you, the owner. Mm -hmm. Actually, I would at any point in, in time argue that the person who owns the fund is the weakest link in this whole process. Oh, of course, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you are the single point of yeah, failure. Yeah, fa <laughs> failure. Like it could be, if you might be, you might have a fortress to like and one bump on the head. Yeah, and then you're like, okay, uh, my all my money is here. This is my pin code. You know, yeah. So you, yeah, that's why like not just like UI UX is just very important, but like education plays uh, another major role in this whole process of onboarding users. If we just like. Even if you just like give them hundred dollars each, just oh yeah, just come play with like the hundred, the three hundred dollars. If you don't educate them enough, they might just lose it. And, like, then, and then they're never gonna deposit. Exactly. They'll like, and then they'll have such a bad experience with the whole process. They'll be like, oh, blockchain is not good. It's not secure. I just lost fun. They actually just tell you it's a scam. Yeah. yeah. Everything. Oh yeah. And if you lose money, it was a scam. <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly. Different. Exactly. And then it's also human mentality, right? It's like kind of like, oh, you're never at fault. It's always someone else's right. fault. So it's like, yeah, these, these things only can be solved by educating the user, educating the people, getting them onboarded. So that's why, like, my the wallet plays, like, we also want to make sure that the people who get into the space are not just getting in to make a quick buck. Most of the users are. Of but, like, at the same time, they are educated enough to at least secure their funds or to, to the survive. point to survive yeah survive in the space exactly so yeah some of the ways that we do this by obviously like messaging like medium and newtopia.com our articles and at the same time we since we have a huge user base we do have a uh, lot of customer support tickets so everyone's welcome to just like if they like uh, hit a problem or issue or something like that they can just like send us a quick email, be like, hey, I do not know how to like continue or go through this process, help me out. And we will do our best to help us out. And that's a very critical part of this process as well, since like, for example, if we did not, if you, if you don't do that, it's, it's, it's like, it's possible that they'll go and read some other material, which is not true or not yeah. correct, and then send the funds to somewhere else. Things like that can happen. So definitely education plays a huge role. Yeah, I mean, you talked about the early days and losing your funds and yeah. private keys. And 
we have a new phishing attack every day. Every day. I mean, if you own a board ape, you might as well just assume that it's going to get lost and you're going to do something. Yeah, stupid. I mean, that's yeah, that's a great like board ape is. I mean, they just got hacked like two days ago. The, their the Discord, Discord, yeah, was, yeah. The Discord was hacked, and, and then right, and uh, someone sent out a phishing link yeah. from the admin, and exactly. But right, you'd feel like you've been doing this for a very long time. Yeah, wouldn't you have expected at this point that? It's going to have learned or is it just just like, I mean, listen, I, yeah. this is not native to crypto and uh -huh. I, I, hate that, I hate that narrative, right? Uh -huh. I mean, I've been getting phone calls about uh, the IRS coming to arrest me and, <laughs> and Nigerian princes you all know, the time. Of time. Yeah. But it's still a daily occurrence that we see wormhole or, you know, X, some sort of bridge exploit or something or just on the retail level, these constant, you click a link and it's, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I swear, I'm pretty sure there's a group of people their full-time job is to create phishing sites for my ETH wallet, but we do have another like company that's constantly monitoring every single registration that like the link or the name is similar to my ETH wallet or not. And if it is, they're like, they put it into a monitoring list. If a website goes live on that domain, they'll immediately like, okay, something's wrong, and then they'll take it down even before it actually hits the market. But like, it is happening. And like you said, it's not new to crypto. Uh, like this has happened to banks. This is happening all the time. IRS calls. Like Nigerian, everyone knows about the Nigerian yeah. prince. We, we um, all know a Nigerian prince. Yeah, best friends. <laughs> and then like, and then gift cards. Like everyone's like, oh yeah, I'm IRS, but you had to buy me a Google Play gift card for five hundred dollars. Like, why would IRS need a Google Play? But like, people do get tricked by these. You know, they're not getting tricked. They only on need purpose. to hit like one in a hundred people. Exactly. For it to be profitable. The ROI is high, and then I mean, people do this constantly, and um, like sometimes they don't even have to think about like like they don't have to dig into smart contract vulnerabilities. It's like, like I said, humans are like the weakest link, so that's what they're exploiting, and at some point in time, we will definitely hit a, like reach somewhere that'll uh, make it easy or like at least let people know before like some action happens in that account but like since it's difficult right now because everything is there's no centralized authority to send out these notifications right everything is happening in the blockchain and the moment if you like link a phone or something now it becomes centralized so yeah there are these problems it's yeah, definitely challenges but we are way more secure than seven years ago i would say sure and, yeah. and you talk about the fact that you went from you know 50 people yeah and now you're three million yeah i want to tell you guys about an amazing product that i literally use every single day athletic green sent me some ag1 to test out and i absolutely am hooked i started taking it every single morning and if you're like me and you need energy to i don't know write a newsletter hit twitter look at some charts chase your kids around hit the gym and you're just not getting that boost in the morning, this product is perfect for you. It has 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source ingredients, probiotics and adaptogens. It's basically like having nine products in one. I guarantee if you guys try AG1, it is going to absolutely change your lives. You will become more awesome. And who does not like becoming more awesome? Now to make this easy, Athletic Greens is gonna give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Melker. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Melker to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Is there a wall, like a certain number where this just doesn't work anymore. Like, because we love to talk about mainstream adoption. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what does a billion people in crypto look like? Yeah, <laughs> that's. I mean, our question. blockchains can't seemingly stay up when they launch an NFT project. Yeah, the blockchain goes <laughs> on. That's the first thing I was thinking about. I was like, oh boy, gas prices, yeah. right? I mean, but like, um, I'm, I know a lot of other chains are working on this problem as well. But like, for example, I know Ethereum is moving to proof of stake soon. Like, it's coming up end of the year the chestnut just went proof of stake yesterday or day before yesterday um so like yes we are in the process of solving like for example like okay how does 10,000 transactions transactions per second sounds like like at this today it'll cost you like probably at that rate if the network is super congested maybe like thousand dollars per transaction that's not gonna work 
So, um, but we all were paying that uh, during we the do. Run just to just to trade on Uniswap. I know this <laughs> is happening, and it's just. I mean, at some point, I'm like, is do users even know they're spending six hundred dollars to buy ten dollars worth of like some token, or is it like a UI issue that they don't even realize they're paying this, and then eventually they're like, oh my gosh, how did my well, I've balance? Seen you guys and now the wallets have been yeah. a much more glaring and yeah. obvious thing. Are you sure that you want to do this? Yeah, and then we now have like, if the gas prices are super high, we have it in red. Yeah. Gas prices yeah. seems yeah. to be high. Are you sure you want to continue this? Or yeah. Or week. <laughs> Four months. <laughs> but Never. <laughs> Maybe wait till uh, the merge. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, there are definitely, like, at least from Ethereum perspective, there, there's a process, there's a um, flow or some kind of timeline to solve some of these issues. But, like, onboarding or universal identity or, like, some kind of, like, secure method to access your wallet is, is still in the process. It might happen in like next yeah. five years, but not as of now. That said, it's not complicated. Like if you if you have two hours to learn about it, you'll know how to secure yourself at like the very minimum level. So People that's aren't willing to take the two hours. Exactly. That's level, that's even with their money. So you were first, right? Uh, kind of as you talked mm -hmm. about, and then of course, I mean, inevitably, a lot of competitors spring up. Oh yeah. Right. So. How do you differentiate yourself when there's so many non-custodial wallets that are popular for various reasons? Yeah. Is it a matter of adding new features? Do you have the first mover advantage? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to deny that we do have the first mover advantage. But at the same time, like our uh, like way of approaching like a feature or like integrating a dApp is, okay, how complicated the current process is and how can we simplify it to three steps? So this is also something like, for example, this is something that we did with ETH staking. Like when ETH staking first came out, um, like for example, the complicated process is you have to either like open up an AWS account or like some kind of infrastructure provider, run your own node, create like a validator key, another like account private key, and then deposit 32 ETH. There's a whole process. Yeah, not easy. You're like, no one's going to do this. Or like some people will do if they're technical enough. And then uh, that's why we are like, oh, stake dot. US is one of our partners, they are doing, uh, they, they can run the validators for you. And then users can simply deposit the 32 uh, ETH and then we will generate their like private key for the their actual account. So we brought it down to 32 steps. So t currently in my all of the processes, if you have 32 ETH, which is a lot, but if you do, your processes, you just go to my wallet, open the DAP section, stake, and then send the 32 ETH and you're done. No, you're staking. And then and then we realized, okay, we're introducing a new problem now because not everyone has 32 ETH. And we are like, okay, let's take a step back. Like, how are we going to solve this? And we were actually in the process of creating our own solution, but then like partners like Stakewise, Lido, uh, they came up with, they, they actually created the process. We are like, okay, we don't have to recreate the wheel. Let's integrate them and give our users access to liquid staking. So now you can simply go to my ETH wallet and stake. Even if you have 0.1 or 0 0.001, doesn't matter. You can just stake it and get rewards and interest on the amount that you stake. So it's like looking at the problem, current existing problem, and not like creating a process just to like get it, like make it happen. It's like taking a step back, looking at it from a user perspective. And another approach that we take is like hiring UI designers who are actually not familiar with crypto, but like really experienced in web design and UI design user experience, and then getting their perspective. They're like, okay, I don't know, I'm so stuck in here. I don't know how to continue to the next step. Like, what are you guys talking about? That's, that's good for us because we know, okay, this is what a new user will go through. And then we'll simplify that process. And we also like a feedback loop. And then once we release it, we'll get support or like customer support tickets and they feel that feel like okay someone's having an issue around this step and then we go back uh, fix it and then see like how it goes so it's like an ongoing process and this is definitely different from most of the non-custodial wallets out there because uh, we do have most of the ac uh, access methods like no matter what kind of wallet you have if it supports ethereum we support that uh, like hardware wallets, software yeah. wallets, even like other non-custodial wallets like Wallet Connect and all that. 
And the other approach is like our user experience process and then customer support team. Not, not many uh, non-custodial wallets has that op those options. So just, you know, being on top of You wouldn't of think it. so if you were on Twitter and you get like a thousand bots telling you to contact for support. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another struggle. Yeah, <laughs> that's another struggle that we face. Yeah. So uh, listen, if you had your dream mm -hmm. 10 years from now, mm -hmm. And the the world has gone to a well, we won't even say a Bitcoin standard, but the, let's say that the majority, you know, a billion, two billion people are crypto native yeah. are using it. What does your product look like? Our product will look like we still want to be like the non-custodial wallet interface. Our product will look like it's, it'll be simple as scan your fingerprint. You'll have a new wallet, and the if you no matter what kind of fiat you come from, as simple as just depositing funds, just from any like bank account, credit card, doesn't matter. But and then at the same time, uh, it's like one product where all the blockchains are supported. It's like it should be blockchain agnostic. And at the same time, users shouldn't be aware of, oh, which blockchain I'm interacting with. Because at that point, I know we are in like multiple layers now, but like at that point, it'll probably be like layer five or something where all the other blockchains sits on underneath it and then layer five is where everything every every wallet like every one wallet is connected to all the blockchains right and so maximum interoperability yeah but with the caveat that you don't know that yeah you don't know that you don't have to know you're not finding some way to bridge yeah i mean that's how it is with like where other websites right we don't know where the servers are hosted we don't know I mean, interact with our bank. We don't know where, like, where the where our actual our data is, where the servers are. It's not up to the user to know that. It's like they don't have to know, but they know there's money in it, and then they know how to transfer it, and that's all that matters. And what kind of things will we be interacting with from that wallet? What are we going to be doing with our ETH or ERC twenty tokens or yeah. our Solana tokens or whatever? Five years from now, good question. Maybe ten. I want ten. ten. Wow. 10 years from now, I think it'll be, uh, I don't want to say everything. Like, I think at that point, you'll be able to go to supermarket and buy anything with crypto. Right. And even maybe USD might live, like, I know there are stable coins, but like USD might live on top of one of the blockchains. And then it's like, it's actual USD is not. The central bank. Currency yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. So you should be able to just like, it's like, I mean, it's already happening. Like El Salvador is like one, Bitcoin is accepted as a legal tender. So like we, we see it's it's happening and then eventually uh, it'll switch to everywhere. Hopefully governments will be okay with it. I mean, if they won't be able to stop it if like if the store starts accepting it. So it's like, you know, that's the future that I want to be in. It's been like, I mean, you've been doing this for seven or eight years. Yeah. I feel like 50. Oh yeah, every it's dog day. years in crypto. Every right? day, yeah. learning something new, something new is happening, and it's like it's so hard to keep track of everything that's going on. That's why yesterday I was talking uh, to some of my colleagues. Like I feel like I had blind, vision. like I was just just focused so much on Ethereum, like horse, like the horse having blinders on the side, that I was not aware of some of these other what the, some of these other blockchains are doing. So, um, yeah. Like you said, so many things, dog ears, it's going by so fast. Well, then I can't imagine what it'll look like in seven years, but we'll have to do this again. If we will, yeah, I loved, again. I'd love to do it. <laughs> well, thank you, man. I really appreciate you taking Yeah, time. thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you haven't already left a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do that now. Spotify just added ratings, so please go ahead and click that five star. I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>